If you didn't know any better, you could be forgiven for thinking that most movies have wildly differing plots from one another. What does the plot of an action movie have in common with the horror movie or an animated kids movie? But the truth is, there's actually a secret formula of sorts to what makes almost all Hollywood movies tick. A certain rhythm that all movie plots follow. If you take any two movies and compare their plots side by side, you will find shockingly similar moments happening in the same order at the same time. This is because most movies follow something called the three-act structure. It's a tried and true recipe for success that's formed the backbone of the movie industry for decades. And perhaps no movie studio is better at using this structure than Pixar. So let's take a look at some Pixar movies, break down their plots and see how the three-act structure informs their writing. Because if we do, we might learn what makes it so great. Let's hit the real basics first. When I say that a movie follows three-act structure, I mean that the overall plot of the movie can be clearly divided into three parts. We have Act 1, our introduction, where we get a sense of our setting and characters and what the ordinary life is like before the story starts. Act 2, which is when something is introduced that disrupts that ordinary life and displays the main conflict. And Act 3, the climax and the resolution of that conflict. For example, in Monsters, Inc., in the first act, we get a sense of what it's like being a professional scarer on the scare floor, and of Mike and Sully's relationship. In the second act, after Boo comes into the monster world, Mike and Sully's lives are turned upside down as they try to hide her. And in the third act, they defeat Randall and show the other monsters that humans aren't so bad after all. To get overly technical for a second, sometimes the three acts are called Thesis, Antithesis, and Synthesis. We get introduced to a status quo in Act 1, a thesis that this is the way the world should be. Then, in Act 2, some kind of conflict comes in, an antithesis that challenges that thesis, that exposes the flaws in the status quo, and creates conflict. Finally, Act 3, the synthesis, combines the thesis and antithesis together, adopting the antithesis into a newer, better status quo. But I know what you're thinking. So what? All stories have exposition, conflict, climax, resolution, duh. I learned that in like 6th grade. And yeah, everything I've talked about so far is all stuff that appears on that plot diagram chart thing that you all probably learned about in middle school, but I'm not done. This is just the broad overview. 3-act structure gets a lot more specific than that. Next I'll go through all the smaller pieces of 3-act structure, using Finding Nemo as an example. We'll track the plot of the movie from start to finish, and point out each structural element as we go. Finding Nemo begins with Marlin and Nemo heading to Nemo's first day of school. This is the establishment of the ordinary world. The part where we get to see what life is like before the story really gets going. Marlin and Nemo live in a reef where everything is safe, organized, and free of danger. And we get to know our main characters. Nemo is an excited, happy, naive kid. And Marlin, because of what happened in the movie's prologue where Nemo's mom died, is really anxious and overprotective of Nemo. Now what's the one thing we have to remember about the ocean? It's not safe. That's my boy. <laughs> Hold my fin. Hold my fin. Dad, you're not going to freak out like you did at the petting zoo, are you? Hey, that snail was about to charge. Dad, Dad, can I go play too? Can I? I would feel better if you go play over on the sponge beds. <gasps> we see them go about their day and interact with each other, until we get to the end of Act 1 and the inciting incident. The inciting incident is, um, the incident that incites the main plot. The thing that starts the story. The inciting incident in Finding Nemo is, well, I'll just play it. Ah, There's our Act 1. Everything is simple and normal until it's not. That brings us into Act 2. Now, Act 2 is easily the vaguest of all three acts. It's also usually the longest act. In a lot of movies, it's actually double the length of Acts 1 and 3. The gist of Act 2 is that now that our characters have a problem that they need to solve, now they're going through a bunch of different obstacles in succession as they try to solve said problem. In Finding Nemo, Marlin tries to track down Nemo, teaming up with Dory in the process, as they travel across the ocean to get to him. Meanwhile, Nemo finds himself in the dentist's fish tank with no way back home. Act 2 can be further broken down into two halves, 2A and 2B, separated by a midpoint. 
In 2A, the characters have just been ripped out of their safe and familiar ordinary world and thrown into a mess of danger and problems. So generally speaking, things go poorly. There's no way out! There's gotta be a way to escape! Who is it? No! No, no, the mask! Get, it, get the mask! Get the mask! Mm, should pee sure? Pee surely? Pee not sure? The characters are completely unprepared, and if they make it through these initial obstacles, it's by the skin of their teeth, as they scramble to keep up with everything this new environment throws at them. This leads into the midpoint, which, besides being the halfway point of Act 2, is also the halfway point of the entire movie. The midpoint is a scene where the characters face their toughest obstacles so far. The midpoint also indicates a raising of the stakes. Now things are really serious. After the midpoint, in Act 2B, we get another collection of obstacles. But now the characters have been through a lot. They're getting more comfortable with this new situation. So when confronted with these new obstacles, they tend to do somewhat better. Everything's gonna be alright! How do you know? How do you know something bad isn't gonna happen? I don't! Look! Sydney. Sydney! Ah, uh, Sydney! Yeah, Sydney again! And then we hit Act 3. This next part might be the most important and defining part of 3-act structure. Act 3 begins with what's called an all-is-lost moment. The characters come closer than they've ever been to their goal, and then... something goes horribly wrong. Something terrible happens that makes it seem like there's no hope for victory, and it pushes the characters close to giving up. Seriously, take any movie, any movie that has a plot anyway, and skip to around the three-quarters mark, and it's basically a guarantee that you'll find a scene where everyone is sad. It's kinda spooky. The all is lost moment of finding Nemo is when Marlin thinks he sees Nemo dead. At this point he believes that his quest was all for nothing, and his spirit is broken. But of course, we know that Nemo was just playing dead, and that he did it to get out of the dentist's office. I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't want that to go away. I don't want to forget. I'm sorry, Dory. The depression of the All is Lost moment never lasts forever. Something always happens to snap the characters out of it. And here, that comes when Nemo tracks down Dory and Marlin and we get our happy reunion. And then, we hit the climax. The biggest, most important, final obstacle of the story. This final challenge is harder than anything that came before. But by using what they have learned on their journey up to this point, the characters achieve victory. I can do this! You're right. And the movie ends with a resolution. A glimpse at how the main characters live their lives now that the story is over. It can be the complete opposite of whatever we saw at the beginning, or it can be mostly the same, but there's always something that's different. In Finding Nemo, Marlin and Nemo return to their reef, but now they love and appreciate and trust one another a lot more. Different people might describe it differently, call things by different names, but these are the plot beats that form the backbone of pretty much every movie in Hollywood. And especially every movie from Pixar. Seriously, let's go through some more Pixar examples and talk about how, even though they're all about different things, they're all variations on the same method of storytelling. Taking a look over the beginnings of each Pixar movie, you'll see that they all have a similar function. The first is to establish an ordinary day in the life of our protagonist, like I've been saying. It sets up what's normal for them to give us a baseline so that when the main conflict comes in and breaks that norm, we understand how big a deal that is. But also there's another element to Act 1 that's just as crucial, pointing out some kind of flaw in that world. There needs to be something in the setup that indicates to us that all is not well, that something needs to change. It can be subtle or it can be blatantly obvious. In Cars, Lightning McQueen is a racing prodigy, and we see through the opening race scene how great he is despite his young age. But we also see that he's an arrogant prick who thinks he can do everything alone. They're giving you 20 tickets for the tiebreaker thing in Cali. I'll pass them on to your friends. Right, friends. Uh, yes, there's, um... 
In Turning Red, Maylin is an ordinary 13-year-old girl who views her life as pretty perfect. Except that we see that her mom is super controlling, and Maylin always obeys her to a fault. Huh? Maymay, what is this? It's nothing, just the boy, he's a no boy? one. In The Incredibles, the Parr family has to hide their superpowers from the world. And the life of not being a superhero puts a serious emotional toll on Mr. Incredible in particular. I don't understand. I have full coverage. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hoganson, but our liability is spelled out in paragraph 17. It states. Even sequels have this as a part of their opening. Even though we know this world already, it's still important to reintroduce the characters since we last saw them, and see how they're holding up since the events of the first movie. Not all these problems are created equal, but all of them are issues that the characters will have to deal with as the story goes on. Issues that will be resolved by the end. After we get a good sense of the ordinary world, the inciting incident comes in. I want to clear up a potential misconception. The inciting incident is not necessarily the first moment of conflict in the story. In fact, it usually isn't. The beginning of Act 1 can and should have some conflict in it. Otherwise, it can get pretty boring. No, the inciting incident is the moment that begins the main conflict. It introduces the main issue that drives Acts 2 and 3. So like, the Incredibles inciting incident isn't when supers are made illegal. It's when Mr. Incredible gets recruited to fight the Omnidroids. And the inciting incident of Toy Story is not when Buzz Lightyear shows up. That begins the conflict between Buzz and Woody, but that's still part of the initial setup. The inciting incident is when Woody accidentally knocks Buzz out the window. Because that leads to them both getting lost. That's the main external conflict of the movie, Woody and Buzz trying to get back to Andy. You are a toy! Basically, all the inciting incidents of the Toy Story movies involve the toys getting separated from their owner. In Toy Story 2, Woody gets stolen by Al. In 3, they get donated to the daycare by accident. In 4, Woody and Forky fall out the back of a car. Then comes Act 2, where the protagonists find themselves knee-deep in the problem created in the inciting incident and are trying to find their way out. Before, I said that in the first half of Act 2, this goes poorly, but there's a specific reason why. This new problem is something way out of the character's comfort zone. And also, remember that the initial problem that we saw in the first act setup? Some issue in the character's lives? These Act 2 problems are directly created to expose that problem. Whatever flaw that the protagonist has makes them the worst possible person to try and solve this. Luca was a sea monster kid who always obeyed his parents and stayed safe below the surface. But then, he's suddenly thrown into a town full of humans and has to figure out how to blend in. His problem was that he always played things way too safe, and now he's completely unprepared to handle this high-risk situation. In Up, Carl is a misanthrope who pushes everyone away after his wife dies. But when he discovers that Russell stowed away on his flying house, suddenly this grumpy old man is stuck traveling with a little kid who is way too friendly for comfort. My elbow hurts and I have to go to the bathroom. I asked you about that five minutes ago. Well, I didn't have to go then. In Ratatouille, Remy is a great cook, sure, but even though he wants to cook in a real human restaurant, he's totally unprepared to navigate the human world. So he has to figure out how to work with Linguini and pilot him around without raising anyone's suspicions. It's important to note that the protagonist doesn't necessarily have to think that things are going badly. They can believe that everything is great, when in reality it is very much not. Like in The Incredibles. Mr. Incredible has a great time beating up the Omnidroid and feeling like a real superhero again. But in doing so, he lies to his wife, neglects his kids, and is totally oblivious to Syndrome's ultimate evil plan. The core of Act 2A is that our protagonist is trying to solve their problems the wrong way. They're trying to apply their usual method of problem solving, but the entire point of these early obstacles is to show how those problem solving methods are flawed. That's why things don't go well. Act 2A introduces our characters to these problems, but relatively speaking, they're only dipping their toes in the water. Getting to the midpoint, we see some kind of indication that, oh no, things are really serious now. It could come in the form of a ticking clock, like in Toy Story 2 when Woody finds out that it'll be sold to a museum in a few days. If the story has a twist villain, now would be a good time to reveal them, like in both Incredibles movies. Or it could be just a simple realization of what it'll take to achieve the main goal. Like when Flick in A Bug's Life comes up with a plan to build the fake bird. It can also be a major internal character realization, where the protagonist changes their outlook on what's happening. Like when Ian and Barley dance with their dad's legs and onward, and get a reminder of why they're doing this. Whatever happens, the main purpose of a midpoint moment is to set up a clear goal and stakes heading into the end of the movie. Whereas the first half might have a lot more aimless messing around and figuring things out, the midpoint refocuses our attention and shows us that this is what we have to do, 
and this is what will happen if we don't do it. Then after that comes Act 2B, another series of obstacles. By now the protagonists have gotten a better feel for what they're supposed to be doing, and they're more comfortable with the situation they're in. But because the midpoint raised the stakes and made everything feel more urgent, things are not really any less challenging than they were. A lot of the time, the characters are a lot more stressed and upset in 2B than they are in 2A. Either way though, they're doing things that they never would have been able to do in the first half. In Cars 3, Lightning McQueen has finally learned to work with Cruiser Ramirez, and takes place in lots of unconventional training techniques before his big race. In Brave, after learning that the curse that turned her mom into a bear will be permanent after sundown, Merida and her mom work together way better than before to reverse it. In Toy Story 3, Andy's toys plan their heist to break out of the daycare. That one's a particularly good example. Act 2A of Toy Story 3 has the toys experiencing the horrors of the daycare. They're directionless and horrified. They don't know whether they should run away or contact Andy, or stay at the daycare and make do with what they have. But the midpoint reveals two crucial pieces of information. That Lotso is evil, and that Andy wants them back. This unites them under one clearly defined goal. Escape and get back to Andy. Then comes Act 3, and the all is lost moment. The reason this always appears before the climax of every movie is to make sure that things don't ever feel too easy. It's proof that the task ahead is both physically and emotionally demanding. The protagonist gives up during the All's Lost moment because the goal appears to be impossible, and that often leads them to lash out at allies and seclude themselves. In Coco, this comes when Miguel learns that his hero and supposed great-grandfather Ernesto de la Cruz is actually a bad guy who poisoned Hector, and then Miguel and Hector get thrown into a pit. Besides the fact that this likely means Miguel will never get out of the Land of the Dead, it also crushes Miguel to learn that his hero is really a monster. In Finding Dory, Dory tracks down her old home in the aquarium, but her parents aren't there, and the chances of finding them seem slim to none. Sometimes the protagonists will actually accomplish their goal in the All is Lost moment, but at a price that they weren't willing to pay. In Soul, Joe succeeds in returning to life, but only after he and 22 have a huge fight. In Cars, Lightning McQueen learns to love the town of Radiator Springs, so when he's discovered and rescued, he realizes that he doesn't want to leave. In Monsters University, Uzma Kappa wins the scaring competition, but then it's revealed that Sully cheated. But eventually, these characters pull through and find a way forward. Miguel realizes that Hector is his real ancestor, not Taylor Cruz. Dory finds her parents by following the shells. Joe re-enters the afterlife to find 22 and apologize. And once characters realize that things are not all lost, and there is a way forward, even if it's not the same way forward as they thought, it's time for the climax. I don't think I need to over-explain this one. The climax is the final big obstacle that the characters need to overcome to resolve the main plot. In Cars 2, the best Pixar movie, that's when Mater tries to stop the evil Cars from blowing up Lightning McQueen. Then once the heroes prevail, the movie ends with a resolution. A glimpse at the new status quo that shows how the events of the story have changed things. The resolution needs to directly address that initial problem at the beginning of the story, and show how the characters' lives have changed for the better. The good dinosaur begins with Arla's family telling him that he's not strong enough to make his mark on the silo, but after going out on his own and facing trials that made him braver, Arla returns home and makes that mark. Wally opens with an empty earth ravaged by pollution where no life can grow. But thanks to Wally and Eve, now humans have returned to Earth and plan to try and restore what they've lost. I will note that in movies that have sad endings where the characters fail, a lot of Act 3 plays out very differently from what I've described, but every Pixar movie has a happy ending, so we'll stick with what we have. So that's every part of 3X structure explored in depth. These are the building blocks of what makes every movie plot work. But why? Why is this the setup for every movie? The answer is all about character arcs. 3-act structure is the most efficient way to make sure that every scene in your movie contributes to the all-important goal of exploring your character's flaws and pushing them to grow. By considering and following each piece of this template, you're guaranteed to make a movie where plot and character are intricately effectively linked. I'll show you what I mean. During the previous section, I used examples from every Pixar movie ever made, except one, Inside Out. That's because I was saving it for the last portion. If we break down Inside Out, act by act, we'll see how the entire plot is deliberately constructed to explore the thoughts and beliefs of our main character, Joy. Act 1. We establish the ordinary world, and at least one major problem with that ordinary world. In Inside Out, we get to meet the five emotions that control the brain of Riley, 
a teenage girl who just moved across the country. Joy is easily the most important and influential of all the emotions. She tells them what to do and when to do it, and she very clearly views Riley's happiness as the most important thing. She especially dislikes Sadness, her opposite, who she basically views as a sickness who needs to be contained, so that she can continue to make Riley happy. Crying. It's, it's just like really the opposite of what we're going for here. Crying helps me slow down and obsess over the weight of life's problems. <sighs> but Riley is having a hard time in her new environment, and Joy can't stop Sadness from butting in. That's our central problem, and Joy's main character flaw. Joy thinks she's the best and that she needs to take charge. She needs to learn that the other emotions have their place, and you can't always be happy all the time. Once that's established, everything in Acts 2 and 3 sets out to show Joy that her views on happiness are wrong. Our inciting incident has Joy and Sadness sucked up a tube and dumped outside the Central Command Center. You're not in headquarters. Without you, Riley can't be happy. So Joy is stuck traveling with Sadness as they try to find their way back as soon as possible. During Act 2A, how does Joy behave? She treats Sandus like a burden and tries to keep Sandus from getting in the way as she tries to solve every problem by herself. And that goes badly. Oh, we'll never make no, it. No, 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 don't obsess over the weight of life's problems. Remember the funny movie where the dog dies? Oh, Sandus, we don't have time for this. Which way? Left? Right. No, I mean, go left. I said left was right, like, correct. Okay. This is where we see our protagonist trying to solve her problems the wrong way. Joy is getting her first taste of why her self-centered worldview is bad and harmful. She applies her usual problem-solving tactics of doing it all herself, and she fails, over and over again. It's proof that there's a flaw in her reasoning. Joy keeps failing until the midpoint, where she watches Sandus actually solve a problem. <laughs> I'm okay now. <laughs> Come on. How did you do that? Well, I don't know. I was sad, so I listened to what- Hey! There's the train! This gives her a little epiphany, where she begins to understand that negative emotions aren't always harmful. Throughout Act 2B, Joy is much more cooperative, working with Sadness and Bing Bong to return to the command center. We see her learning to overcome this flaw of hers, but then in a moment of weakness, she tries to abandon them and send herself back alone. I'm sorry. Riley needs to be happy. Joy? Which fails and sends her and Bing Bong down to the memory dump. This is the all is lost moment, where it looks like there's no hope of getting out. Now, here's the key to how all is lost moments work. The protagonist finds themselves in this bad spot because they've been doing things wrong this whole time. This is their final opportunity to realize that flaw in their worldview. How does Joy get out of the memory dump? Well, Bing Bong sacrifices himself to get her out. That's the plot reason she escapes. Yes, very sad. Anyway. But before that, while she's spiraling in despair, Joy comes to realize the purpose of sadness. It lets other people know that something is wrong and brings them to comfort you. It's not something to be suppressed. That's the moment where she decides to keep going. Mom and Dad, the team, they came to help because of sadness. The All is Lost moment is way more than a character going, Oh no, there's nothing I can do! Oh wait, here's the thing I can do. This has to be the moment where they overcome the character flaw that's been plaguing them since the beginning of the movie. After having gotten through the All is Lost moment, and with the new lease on life, the protagonist heads into the climax a changed person. Joy and Sadness race back to the command center as Riley's brain is falling apart around them, and restore everything back to normal. And the resolution shows us this new status quo that proves that Joy learned her lesson, showing us how Joy now allows the other emotions to contribute a lot more. You ready? Yeah. Alright. Let's play some hockey! And that's 3 act structure for you. Pixar has been the leading voice in animated movies for decades, and a lot of that credit goes to their absolute mastery over this narrative tool. Try looking at other movies to see if you can spot these elements as you watch. And if you're writing a movie script, or another work of fiction of a similar length, consider applying this to your writing. You might find that it really helps you out. There's a reason why this structure has stuck around for as long as it has. To put it simply, it works. It just works. Do you ever look at someone and wonder, what is going on inside their head? <laughs> 